Hi, I'm Paul Beck with uh, continuing my AGU uh, mishmash. So, in terms of Arctic amplification, uh, we're definitely in a, a new regime. And this was discussed by Thomas Hain from John, John Hopkins. Um, there was a paper, Hain and Martin, 2017, Scientific Reports. And they talked about this term seasonality, which is defined basically as the range divided by the mean. So the seasonality is going up more and more, you know, and when it, um, you know, eventually to uh, an Arctic with no ice in the in in the uh, summer, right? Just in the in the winters, uh, you know, when it's got complete seasonality. Okay, so and then and then when we lose all ice in the winters and stuff, then again the seasonality will, will drop. It'll be open all year round. But that's that's just my additional comment. That wasn't mentioned at all in this paper. Um, and he looked at the vol at the extent of volume and extent and area stuff like that. Arctic plus Antarctic. Uh, looked at the you know the Arctic warming ten degrees global four degrees so a two point five times ratio of Arctic amplification. So basically seasonality is increasing. I've talked about this in the past in terms of nonlinear systems reaching fresh approaching critical thresholds and things. This wasn't discussed at all in this paper, but basically when you approach a threshold, you can get this slowing down effect. So instead of rapid spikes up and down with a fast response time, if you have a slow response time, you get a spike upwards and it takes stays up for a while and takes a while, sluggishly comes down and goes down below. So things, the, the frequency of the movement slows down and that can often signal that you're reaching a, a tipping point or, or a threshold. Very interesting paper by an un, a very impressive undergraduate who did this summer project uh, her name is Rosa M. Vargas Morte, and she's from Puerto Rico. And she was in Puerto Rico during the during the terrible, um, devastating hurricane. Um, so she's uh, she did this summer project, um, summer student fellowship program, and she looked at the role of the ocean and atmospheric heat transport. Um, under Arctic amplification. So how much of the heat is being transported up there, you know, greatly warming Arctic, how much is transferred up there from the ocean, from the atmosphere, how much is generated in the region from, from the darkening. Um, so she looked at, there were 20 CMIP-5 models, and then uh, the CESM, the, the uh, Community Earth System model, large ensemble, and basically, the results showed that over time, right now, you know, the atmospheric heat, um, tr transfer of heat into the Arctic uh, is dominated, you know, what heat goes up there is dominated by the atmosphere, but over time, as time goes on, the atmospheric component will decrease and the ocean component will increase. So the ocean will eventually dominate it. She looked at, um, you know, heat going past 70 degrees north. Um, from 1920 uh, to present and then mo modeled out to 2100. You know, the heat is, you can have moist air and that's the, the water, the, the water vapor is carrying a lot of the heat or just dry air. You can separate those components. Um, and basically uh, looking at the components um, from the oceans, from the Atlantic Ocean versus the Pacific Ocean. So the Atlantic Ocean uh, the heat in the Atlantic Ocean is dominating. More heat in the Atlantic is going up into the Arctic than in the Pacific. But then over time, the Pacific has a steady rise and the Atlantic has a drop. So then, you know, over time, the Pacific may eventually come to dominate. Very, very interesting study. Um, James Overland, in a co paper co-authored with Jennifer Francis, talked about North American Arctic mid-latitude weather linkages and different connections to the North Pacific and, you know, looked at internal variability from the, the ENSO, La Nina, El Nino, and looked at case studies um, on and, and at different ice reduction in different regions and tried to relate that to uh, weather patterns and stuff. So looked at the vorticity or spinning um, of the atmosphere looked at the geopotential heights, looked for stationary patterns. Now, Jennifer Francis says it takes two to tango. 
you know, the two being the Arctic and the Jets. So one moves, the other moves, one changes, the other changes. It takes two to tango. Um, Overland puts it more as the Arctic is always there. The Arctic heating is always there. The jet stream is shy. Sometimes it shows up and tangos, other times it doesn't. So slightly different sort of viewpoint. And they looked at case studies like the Alaska Ridge case, um, you know, Ridge and, uh, you know, that can be related to, you know, the very warm temperatures in California, very warm temperatures in, uh, you know, Alaska's unbelievably warm temperatures, um, right? And cold in Florida, that type of thing. So they were looking at that. Um, Alexei Fedorov at Yale talked about, can the Arctic sea ice decline weaken the AMOC? Okay, so used an ocean model aptly called NEMO and uh, looked at the flux of the AMOC over 50 years and, and tried to project it forward 50 years, 100 years and uh, use these different models and you know with reduced albedo of sea ice, reduced emissivity of sea ice and thought that there could be a decline of up to one third um, and uh, the AMOC decline was causing the cold spot in the Atlantic. So the Gulf Stream is declining and as it goes across the Atlantic it descends, it's, coo it's cooler and we get this cold spot in the Atlantic because of this shifted pattern. Now this is different. The original view was that the cold spot was just due to Greenland melt from Greenland and uh, that was prevailing around 2015 when I talked to Jason Box in Paris and told him well what I think it's probably just the Gulf Stream is slowing down it's sweeping over the east coast of the US and uh, you know that's why the cold anomaly is there and he said hmm yeah interesting and you know it turns out that that's that's accurate that's the case um, so, so there was some more heat transport from the Arctic to mid latitudes looked at in terms of the, the, they call it the warming hole. So if you have a hole in warming, that's the cold blob basically in the Atlantic. And, and then uh, that's associated with the warm blob in the Pacific. So it's to do with the jet stream configurations and, and the Arctic warming is the root cause. He talked about two to five times amplification of warming. This was Paul Hessel. And then um, that evening there was a talk on scientific integrity and freedom in the federal government. So I went and, uh, you know, it was about whistleblower protection, anti-muzzling, you know, rights of the citizen. And I said, this is all old stuff. If you look at, look at Canada, you know, what's happening in the U.S. now has happened previously in Canada. So just look at what happened under the Harper government. I think Harper, I think Harper moved to the, the U.S. and he's you know, running a lot of the show down in the U.S. at the moment. So, uh, you know, a lot of scientists are, are there, there's scientific reticence to speak to reporters because reporters then take sound bites or they misquote them or they write articles and, you know, there's inaccuracies. So there's a lot of reticence in the scientific community just to speak, to communicate their, their work. And this has to change to get the climate change message out. So maybe it, something can be set up for the Washington, uh, for AGU in Washington next year. Um, there are a bunch of talks on, you know, can we stay to 1.5 degrees C? You know, can we stay under two degrees C? You know, the rocky road to one and a half, uh, reevaluating the Paris targets and you know, I think most people are saying that we can't, we need negative emissions technology in order to do this. Um, Michael Mann had a very interesting talk and he's had a paper on this and I've discussed this in the past. Um, I think it came out in July 2017. Basically the 1850, what do we mean by one and a half and two degrees in the Paris Agreement? I mean, the 1850 you know, the original agreement was, I, was pre-industrial, 1750 temperatures, so two degrees relative to 1750 or one and a half relative to 1750, but this has somehow morphed into uh, more like an 1850 to 1900 baseline, which is in, it, it's inappropriate to use this baseline because we had, according to man, we had 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 degrees Celsius of temperature increase from 1750 to 1900. Okay, so 
if we already had that point two degree, then from that baseline, 1850 to 1900, we can have only 1.3 or 1.8 degrees of warming instead of 1.5 and two, right? Keep comparing apples to apples. So instead of having 300 gigatons of emission space left in order to, you know, stay under that two degree target, uh, we would need instead of having 300 gigatons left with that 0.2 degree rise, that means that cuts in about 120 gigatons. So we have to reduce that 300 gigatons left to by 40%. Uh, to uh, you know, so we have to reduce it down to 180 gigatons left. Um, and I believe that's to get two degrees. I'd have to check whether that's two or one and a half. And this assumes that cumulative emissions, um, it's a linear assumption. Warming is proportional to uh, cumulative emissions. So, uh, so there was other, um, and then there were some talks on understanding the effectiveness of CO2 removal because people are slowly realizing in the scientific community that the RCP uh, 2.6 scenario um, that the RCP 2.6 scenario requires requires um, requires uh, CO2 removal. It requires negative emissions technology, which we don't have. I mean, they talk about like they assume that bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is going to do the job and can can reduce take carbon out of the atmosphere. You know, and everything's hunky dory. We can have that low emission scenario, but that's not. I mean, this is a slippery slope that we're that we're heading. It, things have to be made very clear. This is very simple stuff, and to try to convolute it in the eyes of the public, you know, with these targets, they have to be specified and be very very clear. Uh, and you know, that two degrees and one and a half degrees were relative to 1750. That was in the original documents. You can't slide the baseline up to 1900 and then slide slide your activity to say you can have negative emissions technology remove carbon from the atmosphere without you know without explicitly stating that and there's a big difference between a one and a half and two degree world there was an invited talk by andrew king university of melbourne and he talked about the differences between a one and a half to two degree world he was mostly focused on Australia, but in terms of coastal flooding, the severity of flooding, sea level rise, all of these things are much worse in a two degree world than a, than a one and a half degree world. Um, there's a huge, it's, there's a huge difference there. Um, and uh, there were some other talks about, more talks on climate variability, um, the, uh, you know, what happened when there were changes in the Arctic gateways so millions of years ago um, as the continents were shifting there were there were uh, changes in gateways and stuff and, and and that affected heat transport into the Arctic and things like that um, there was also talks about trying to determine when the uh, AMOC shut down in the past um, from uranium thorium dating and then Stefan Ramsdorf gave a talk um, very good talk about the uh, called the observed fingerprint of a weakening Atlantic Ocean overturning circulation. So he talked about so the the modeling was done again the CMIP five community, uh, not community um, climate model intercomparison project five the latest version, and he he basically said that the weakening the AMOC is weep weakened by about three sphere drop since 1950. That's uh, a drop from 19 sphere drop to 16 sphere drop, which is a 16% drop. And this is, uh, this is this weakening of the AMOC is, uh, you know, the, the reason why we have the, uh, the cold blob, or if you like the warming hole, where a cold blob is a warming hole, okay? Depends on how you look at it. He also talked about the Pacific connections to the Atlantic, sort of bridges and things like that. So, so basically, um, you know, we've got a greatly warming Arctic. We've got Arctic amplification. The jet streams uh, shift and become much wavier and we're getting these, these ocean extreme temperatures in the ocean, cold blob in the Atlantic, uh, warm blob in the Pacific. Thank you.